So this video is going to look at LMC, which is an assembly language program, which simulates how assembly language works and how it relates to the parts of the computer and what's actually going on inside your computer whilst a program is running. So before we actually look at the simulator itself, we need to learn a bit about computer architecture. So you might have heard the word architecture when you're talking about buildings and how the buildings are put together and designed. So it's the same with computers. They can be designed in different ways and different parts can be made in different computers. They can be different in different computers. Um, and it could be designed to function in a slightly different way. So the most common architecture that is needed to be known at GCSC is known as von Neumann architecture. And what you've got in von Neumann architecture, if I just show you the, all, the whole image, is in the center, you've got this central processing unit, the CPU. It kind of, it carries out all the arithmetic calculations, um, any logical calculations need to be done. And it goes step by step through a program and carries out the instructions. And that works in tandem with the memory unit. So this is the RAM, the random access memory. And that's where all the instructions and data are stored for a program. So if you're running a program, all the information that's needed to run that program is stored inside the memory unit in the RAM. Um, and then the way that they, this data gets passed back and forth is by something called buses. So you've got a data bus which carries data between maybe the, the memory unit and the central processing unit. So it just carries the data around to where it needs to go. And then in order for a person to actually interact with the CPU and the memory unit, you actually need to have input devices. So keyboard and mouse. When I move the mouse, I see that reaction then is output on the screen to an output device. So I move the mouse, the computer works out the instructions on what it should do when the mouse is moved, and then it's shown on the screen, it's sent to the output device. So I can see the result of what I've done. The computer has worked out what it needs to do. It moves the cursor across the screen, and then that is, I can see that on the screen on the output device. So that's the basic architecture of von Neumann. Now there are other ways that these can be, computers can be put together. Um, the main ones you need to know for GCSE are von Neumann and Harvard. You don't need to know too much about Harvard and how it works uh, deep down, but just know that it's different. And the reason that it's different is that in von Neumann architecture, your instructions and your data, so the lines of code that you write and any variables that you might use within the program, they are stored in the same place, in the same memory unit. So in the same area of RAM. And there's only one bus that is used for both. So the instructions and the variables, the data, are treated in the same way. Essentially, they are just numbers, binary numbers, stored in the same locations. And the computer can recognize if some are instructions and if some aren't. Now, the opposite, uh, well, the thing that's different with Harvard architecture is you actually have two separate locations, one for instructions, so one for the lines of code, and one for the data. So any variables you use will be stored in a separate memory location. So this means that you could actually run a program, you could carry out the instructions, you could fetch the instructions, and you could also fetch the data at the same time. It has a bus that fetches from the instruction memory and a bus that fetches from the data memory. So whereas with von Neumann, the same bus goes to get the instruction and then it'll go and get the data. In Harvard, you could actually have a bus that gets the instruction and a bus that gets the data at the same time. So you can access them simultaneously. So the reason we need to know about the architecture is so that we can see how assembly language works and how it relates to the hardware and the architecture of the computer. So assembly language is a low level programming language and it uses an assembler to convert a program into machine code. So when you write a program in Python or Java, any of these high level languages, or if you write it in an assembly language, and today LMC is our pretend assembly language, the computer can't run these straight away. It doesn't understand words like print or um, what the functions would be used, um, square root, I'm trying to think of the words. It doesn't understand these 
characters, this text that we're typing in, it needs to actually be converted into machine code, which is just binary numbers. Because ultimately a computer is just a lot of on and off switches. That's a way of thinking about it. So it can only understand zero as off and one as on. So we need to convert any code that we write into machine code. And assembler is what does this for assembly language programs. An assembly language is different to high level language because it doesn't use, the language it uses isn't as close to English as high level languages. So for example, it uses short mnemonics as instructions instead of full words, which are more obvious what they mean. So the short mnemonics, for example, could be imp. So maybe in another language, in Python, for example, you'd have the whole word input. It's very obvious what it means. This takes it down and shortens all the instructions into short mnemonics, where we have INP to mean input. Uh, another example would be STA, which means store in an address, in a memory address. Um, we've got LDA, which is load from a memory address. Out, which means output. Halt, which means to stop the program running. And we've also got DAT, which we'll talk about either later on in this video or in another video that comes afterwards. So it uses short mnemonics, um, and because it's shorter and there's not as much code, and because it's closer to machine code than high level languages, assembly language usually runs faster. It, you can compile it faster. Um, it takes less time to translate. So because of that, um, assembly language, if I can find the thing, yeah. Assembly languages are usually useful when speed of execution is critical or when we're writing software which interfaces directly with the hardware. So if you've ever used a device driver, you all have, you might have had to update your driver for your mouse or your keyboard. That is usually written in uh, assembly language because it's code that needs to work quickly. If I move the mouse and it took a few seconds to actually react on the screen to see the cursor move, then it wouldn't be very good. We want it to be as fast as possible. So that's when assembly languages are used. Usually is when um, the speed of execution is critical. So the program we want to be looking at and focusing on today is Little Man Computer. And it's a simulator that mimics von Neumann architecture. And the really important concept of this and is the important concept for any ages, um, if you're teaching in schools, even in primary, you could use this uh, concept, which is called the fetch, decode and execute cycle. So anytime you have uh, a program, the computer needs to fetch the instruction. It then decodes it. It has to work out what the instruction is telling it to do. And then it carries out that instruction. Once it's finished executing the instruction, it then cycles back and gets the next instruction until it reaches the end of the program. And that's how all computer programs work. And we'll see how this works with LMC when we actually run an example. So we'll go quickly through the LMC environment. So the first thing you need to know is the accumulator. And this is like the active memory of the simulator. So it's located here. And any instructions where we are taking an input, that'll get passed into the accumulator. If we are loading from a memory address, it loads into the accumulator. If we are storing anything into a memory address, it takes what's in the accumulator and puts it in that memory address. And if we are outputting a number, it takes whatever's in the accumulator currently and outputs it into the output box. So the accumulator is like the go-between, the man in the middle. Anything that is moving back and forth usually goes through the accumulator as a middle step. You've got your program counter. That is just telling you which instruction you're currently running. So it shows the memory location that the processor is running. So for example, here the program counter is zero, which tells you that it's actually on the current instruction in memory location zero. I'll explain more about uh, that later on. You've got your instruction and address register. So this shows which type of instruction is being used and which memory address it's being used on. So the instruction register will tell me which what kind of instruction it is. And the address register tells me which memory address is it being used on? Is it box zero? Is it box three? Is it box 24? That was what the address register would tell me. 
It could even be 0, 1, which would be the input box down here, or 0, 2, which is the output box. Okay, so memory addresses. So I've already mentioned these. These are the memory addresses which are used to store instructions and data. So on the right-hand side, you've got your memory addresses, where it says RAM at the top. This is where all your instructions for the program and all of your variables or data is actually stored when it's being run. So in this example, you've got a one, two, three, four, five lines of code on the left here. Now you can see once that code is written, it gets loaded into the RAM. So the input instruction is instruction 00. zero. So that input instruction is actually stored in box zero here. So input in this simulator is represented by the number 901. And then if it went to the box number one, where there's a store instruction, that's stored in box one here. So store in memory address 04 is represented by the code 304. So these numbers are actually the representations of the instructions. So how would I write input? How does the computer understand input? Well, in this simulator, it understands it as 901. How does it understand store in box four is 304. Load from box four is 504. And add whatever's in box four um, is 104. I actually forgot to put a halt instruction there, but we'll come back to that later. Okay, so instructions and data are stored in the same memory locations, so the same RAM, and they're treated in the same way. You've also got the input box, where if you want the user to input a number, then you can ask them to input it in the input box down here. And then you've got the output box, where if you want to display a value, um, you want to output a value after a calculation is done, maybe, then it'll be taken from the accumulator, whatever's in here, and it'll be put in the output box. So that's important with these instructions, is that you know exactly what they do. Um, in the exam, you might be asked to write out or to work out what a program is actually doing. So you need to understand what each line of or what each instruction in the LMC language actually does. So we'll do a simple program together, and then I think I'll make another video for going through the tasks. So we've got taking input as our first instruction. So the name is input, the mnemonic is INP. So if I was gonna write it in LMC, I'd write INP. And this is represented in the actual memory as 901. So when the computer sees this value 901, it knows it means input and it should go and carry out an input instruction. So the description is the input instruction copies the value input by the user into the accumulator. So two main things to note there are copies and where it goes. So it doesn't take a value and put it somewhere else. When we're doing this in this program, usually anytime uh, data has been retrieved or taken somewhere and stored or loaded, it copies the value. It doesn't take it so that value is still in that same location, but we've copied it somewhere else. And in this instance, it copies whatever's in the input box into the accumulator. Then what happens next? Well, after the value has been copied, the program counter will move on to the next memory location. It just moves on to the next box to fetch the next instruction. Okay, uh, the next instruction we'll look at is output. So again, the mnemonic for this is OUT, out. And the representation of that in the memory would be 902. So the output instruction copies the value that's in the accumulator. So whatever is in the accumulator, it copies it into the output box. And in the same way, once this instruction is carried out, the program will move on to the next uh, memory location, the next instruction. And the last one we'll need for this is stopping the program. So we've got mnemonic for the instruction halt, and the mnemonic is HLT. 
and the actual value for this in the memory location is 0, 0, 0. And you might have noticed that the actual um, default value is 0, 0, 0 in this simulation. So it actually stops the program for you. However, you should always, if you want the program to stop, always put um, HLT at the, at the end of your code. And it's, as it says, so the execution of the program will stop. It won't carry on. If you put HLT and then you try to take an output afterwards, well, it'll just stop. It won't reach that output instruction. So we'll make a simple program, which takes an input and then outputs it and then halts. So if I go to the actual simulator, I want to, I can write on the left hand side here, imp is the first instruction. I press enter to go to the next line. We're going to have out and then the last line is halt. I notice I always write um, the mnemonics in capitals. They should always be in capitals, just so that when we're using variables later on, they stand out. You can easily identify what are mnemonics and what are variable names and so on. Once I've typed the three instructions, I click submit, and then it changes this, what I've typed in, into actual, it shows the code there. If not all the lines of code appear on the right-hand side, then you must have made a mistake somewhere. So just double check that it looks like it matches what you've typed in properly. And you can see it's written the code there and also it's loaded the values for each instruction into the boxes. So in box 00, we've got the input, which is 901. In box 01, we've got output, which is 902. And in box 02, we've got the halt instruction which if you remember was zero, zero, zero. So that's what's in box number two there. Now, if I click run, you can actually change the speed that the program runs at. So I click run and I slow it down. You can see these things moving around the screen. So these are kind of representations of the buses. So this one is going to fetch the first instruction. It fetches from box one, that's right, box zero, because it starts at zero. And it's getting that instruction, which is just data at the moment, it's just a number, and it goes into these registers where the CPU works out, okay, it's nine, that means it must be either an input or an output, it recognizes it as an input output instruction. And the zero one is telling it, I need to go to box zero one. Now, the slight confusion about this is it doesn't mean this box up here, it actually means this zero one down here, the input box. So it's waiting for me to type in an input and this little guy says input required. So if I put in 23, you'll see a bus then copies the value and stores it into the accumulator. So the input takes whatever's in the Im input box and copies it into the accumulator. And now the bus is going to fetch the instruction from the next um, location and it fetches the instruction 902, which we wrote in was output. It means output. So again, the nine, the leading digit means it's an input or an output instruction, but this time it's zero two, which tells it it needs to go to box, the output box. And what it's done is you just saw that bus copies the value 23 and puts it in the output box up here. So it's fetched the instruction it's decoded it, the CPU has worked out what it means, and then it's executed it, it's carried out the instruction. And now the last time it's fetching the last instruction, which is gonna be halt, and this is a value of zero. Once it decodes what that means, it'll stop the program. And you can see down here it says program halted, um, so that program has now stopped. So I took an input, where I typed in number 23, that got copied into the accumulator, and then my next instruction was output, where it just copies whatever's in the accumulator and puts it into the output box. And then I put in a halt instruction to stop the program. Okay, so hopefully that's explained more about how Little Man Computer, how this simulation works and what computer architecture is. And then in the next video, I'll show you some tasks that we'll go through and I'll 
code them and try to explain step by step how to actually complete those tasks.